All right, everybody, welcome back to another OpenShift Commons briefing. Um, we'll be live streaming um, on multiple channels on Twitch, Facebook, and YouTube, and we'll collect your questions from there. Uh, today we have um, a soon-to-be new, hopefully, Commons member, KPMG, joining us to give us a talk on their Ignite um, platform for, well, we'll find out what it's all for. It's machine learning, data science, all kinds of good stuff. But we have Kevin Martelli and Hong Fei Kao, um, who I'll let introduce themselves in more depth and talk a little bit about the Ignite platform and how they're running it on OpenShift. And then we'll have a technical demo and live Q&A, as always, at the end of this. So please, Kevin and Hong Fei, take it away. Great. Thank you so much. And, and, and thanks, everyone, for taking the time out uh, to, to go through this presentation. Um, quickly, before we dive into the details, I uh, want to quickly introduce myself. So my name is Kevin Martelli. I'm a principal software engineer at KPMG, overseeing our big data software en engineering team. Um, a lot of stuff related to cloud containerizations and end-to-end um, -end deployments with machine learning. Uh, with me, I also have a colleague, Hong Fei Kao. Um, Hong Fei, maybe a quick introduction on yourself? Yes. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Hong Fei Kao. I'm a big data engineer uh, director from Lighthouse KPMG. Uh, my specialty is uh, on the uh, big data analytics, uh, machine, uh, distributed machine learning deployment, uh, as well as uh, cloud computing. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Hong Fei. <clears throat> so, as was mentioned, we're, we're going to give you a little bit of a background around um, the motivation that we had on building what we call KPMG Ignite, which is our data science platform and ecosystem to bring use cases from POCs into production. Uh, we'll drill a little bit into to what Ignite is so the, um, the audience can get a feel for what we're doing with Ignite, how it works on top of um, OpenShift, and, and, and ultimately how it, it chooses to produce business value. Um, and then finally, we'll go into some architectural componentries of it. And then I think the, 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 the last part here on number four which is, which is the, the demonstration. And what we hope to do is through all the different parts that we'll, we'll, we'll take out, uh, we'll walk through a very detailed technical demonstration. The demonstration will be representative of how the business can interact with it, how data scientists can interact with the platform, as well as how engineers can interact with the platform and how we can productionalize these pipelines um, on top of OpenShift within containers. So looking forward to this. Um, and again, any questions, please feel free to type them in as we go. So the first question that, that many of you may ask is, is, why did we decide to build and invest so heavily into this platform that we use um, for our internal data science as well as client initiatives? And you know, probably like many of you could guess, um, one of the main drivers was the just the explosion, if you will, of AI in the marketplace. You know, many clients, you know, looking at it to leveraging it, how can they use it? And we saw that there's a need there to kind of bring some of these technologies together. And not only from the standpoint of you know, being able to, I would say, productionalize use cases. We do see a lot of people that are able to build cool POCs, but they're not always necessarily able to get them into a into a productionalized format. So one of the things within within our Ignite platform is how can we come and, and, and bring these, these capabilities from both the POC to realize production? Um, in addition, making sure we have those right hooks. So how does the business interact with the platform and our scientists and engineers? And again, we'll drill a little bit into, in, into that detail. But as we looked at that, there's really about you know, five or so areas that, that we see that enterprises need to be aggressive in in order to support AI and be able to bring AI more seamlessly into the, uh, into the organization. Um, some of these areas we do cover by Ignite, and then some of these areas you know, have to be augmented with separate business processes. Um, you know, one of the, the important things here on number one is around data literacy and, and building out your data expertise. And we used to think about this more along the lines of something that an engineer, a scientist, a business analyst would do. But this is more holistically now across the organization. How do business folks understand their data? Can they get the right training data? Do they have access to the right data? Um, within Ignite, you'll learn we have different you know, ways that this could be achieved. We have user interfaces. We have you know, data sets from the technical side, which we'll talk through a little bit. Um, the next is around technology. And I, I think we can all kind of agree that there's been a technology explosion in the space. Every, every day you wake up, there's new technologies available to produce you know, similar types of um, outputs and what technology should you use, what technology um, shouldn't you use, where do you want to do your R&D investing around. Um, one of the things we took for Ignite is that we realized that this market was going to be expanding so quickly, so we needed a very open ecosystem 
uh, microservices, containerization, easy to plug in and plug out as these new AI tools and capabilities came to the marketplace. Um, and that's something that we'll show you too within this demonstration. Um, business processes, how do business processes now change? How are people relying on the data from data science? How are people embedding this into their day-to-day -day, you know, work activities? How are the enterprises adopting this? Um, and then the, the workforce, it's, it's, it's important that we enhance some of our legacy skill sets. We, 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 we hire new folks and, and how does our workforce support this? How do we move from sort of the legacy monolithic into these more agile, you know, quick developing um, and productionization of, of, of machine learning uh, pipelines? And then the final part I'll, I'll just briefly touch on is around uh, risk and reputation. I, I think we all know um, that there could be a lot of uh, risk associated to some of this. The, the importance of you know, understanding your model, um, understanding the details that are going into your model, how are you managing this? Um, we, we see a lot of organizations you know, you know, coming up with ways that they can have explainability and, and making sure that their, minds, their, their, their models are fixed with bias and how do you fix these things. So there's, there's new risk and reputational risk that organizations are facing in, in, in this era. And again, these are some of the capabilities we hope that we can help support through the deployment of our KPMG Ignite platform. <clears throat> So with, with that, I'll jump down to, you know, what is KPMG Ignite? And, and we touched a little bit on these topics um, earlier, but essentially we have the who, the what, and the why. Um, from the who, who, who is this platform built for? And who were we having in mind that could use it? It, it was a platform predominantly built for our, our, our data science and data engineers, um, so they could build the, the, the pipelines. Um, however, you know, without having the business and the uh, ability for others, analysts, et cetera, to be able to put input into the system, it, it, it just wasn't necessarily as, um, I would say, useful. So there's business hooks. So whether that comes from annotating and creating trading data, whether that comes from validating model results, there's different areas where, where, where um, the business and business analysts can come in to work within the platform. Um, the what part. So, so, so what is it? And we talked a little bit before. This is a, a, a global AI platform. We have a very modular slash microservice type of delivery. So each module, and we'll, we'll dive into that, could be an OCR job. A module can be a model. A module can be a data extraction. So we'll, we'll jump into some of these things, what these models are. But they're built in such a way that they're sort of interchangeable. So if there's a new capability in the marketplace that comes out and we want to take advantage of it, you can plug it into the platform seamlessly. And as capabilities deprecate, they can be removed from the platform. Then finally, the why. What we noticed is that, you know, as we mentioned before, there was a high demand for these types of capabilities. But more importantly, as organizations sort of took their journey into the AI space and unstructured data and semi-structured, there was a lot of work around unstructured data sets. So loan, loan documents or contract documents, PDF documents, how could organizations get the right information out of them, voice documents, et cetera, and make the correct uh, business decision? So this was really the why of, of this platform and why it was built sort of with an unstructured data set in mind. Again, going back to sort of the, the prior point, this was a platform that was built for data scientists as well as data engineers um, with, with those business hooks. And as we mentioned, it, it's very important that the business had a way to integrate into the platform to provide the right data set, both from a training perspective as well as a, a data validation perspective, um, back into the process to making sure that we were building the right models, deploying the right models, and kind of meeting the business requirements and expectations. Um, and then the modular component architecture. This is, I would say, the crux of what we build our platform on. We're really building it on the, 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 the foundation of very small capabilities and services that could be interchanged with other services so you can string together a pipeline to produce some type of output. For example, maybe a pipeline is you need to OCR a PDF document. You then need to break down that PDF document so you can start making business decisions. So maybe you add some you know, spacing into, into it to, to, to enhance it, or you might do some sectioning of the document, and then ultimately you might make some type of business decision on it. All these different components are modular and kind of executed by themselves. Or you can call different components that may reside in different cloud providers, whether that's you know GCP, AWS, or Azure. Um, another another area was that it was um, you could be deploy it via containers, or it supports RESTful services into the platform based on the the demand that that you need to uh, push through. And then finally, it, it's around reusability. So all these components are reusable. So if one person creates a component in the community 
and that component has a capability of doing something, that component gets checked in, can be re-leveraged and then rebuilt into an image and ultimately brought back into the platform. And again, some of this might be a, a little confusion through the talk, but once we drill into the demonstration, I think it will become a little bit more real. And then finally, you know, it unlocks the, the value of unstructured data uh, with, with surgical precision. So one of the things that we, we really want to do is be able to get out that content in, in, in documents that are able to help the business make decisions. And many times you'll have hundreds of pages of documents, but there's only certain sections or clauses or dates or information that the business needs to be able to make that, that, that business decision. And, and, and how do you get that information out? And that's all part about this pipelines that can be built on top of the platform about how this, uh, the I call it the documents become mature and more and more enriched so you can start extrapolating out the right information to then be able to make uh, the right business decisions. So as, as I was mentioning, you know, Ignite is really, you know, made up of, of many different layers as you see here. And, and what I guess I wanna talk about is what I call sort of the foundational pieces that make Ignite Ignite. And we really break it down into these, uh, these five buckets. So a loom is really the main mechanism of how Ignite communicates from one component to another. And it's a, it's a proprietary uh, data type or data element that we use here. But what it does is it allows for one component to receive data in and push data out in a consistent way. And a loom is really nothing more than an enhanced JSON. Um, the next is we have our data science notebooks, which many of you are probably you know, familiar with. Within the data science notebooks, you have the ability to um, read and get your own uh, your own pipelines and workflows to to test them, to build them, and then deploy them. Um, the data science notebook themselves it's done through Jupyter Hub, and then each user will get sort of their individual notebook. And then we talked about a little bit around how the business and users can get in there. And we have two main mechanisms. We have the annotation UI, which Hong Fei is going to be able to go through in our demonstration, which I think is pretty powerful. How business users can then annotate documents, and those annotations are ultimately fed in to feed the models. Um, and then there's some management uh, UIs as well. And these are these are areas where you can build workflows and, and, and string things together in a more user-friendly way versus building it out through um, different code bases. And then finally, one of the things I think which is a gap in some of the other um, areas that we deal with is around model management. And the ability to manage your model, understanding the statistics associated to your model, many times feeding into your model governance process, as well as serving up models. And I guess one last thing I want to show on this slide is if we sort of understand the platform, I want to walk through from the bottom, from the pools of persistent volumes, up through kind of the, the application layer, just to give you a feel for how the platform itself works. So at the bottom, we have persistent volumes for the, our, our, our OpenShift cluster that, that are attached into the cluster. And if you move one layer up, we have our core infrastructure. So what we use is we use distributed MinIO to facilitate object storage, which gives us better latency, faster read and write times. We also have a, a Postgres database that stores a lot of the metadata associated to um, the processing and the workflows. Uh, we have our logging and reporting within Kibana and Elasticsearch. We use Kafka as our message broker. So Kafka is really set up in a way that allows you to um, as you execute one component to the next component, Kafka is a way that keeps the, 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 the queue for the next component to pick up. And then finally, everything's executed across the, um, the containerization platform and orchestration through OpenShift. All right, uh, I will take from there. Uh, as uh, uh, Kevin mentioned, uh, the whole Unite platform uh, is designed for data science and uh, uh, you know, data scientists and the data engineer, right, for, uh, you know, so to build arbitrary uh, machine learning pipeline and also, um, you know, easily collaborate, um, you know, for different uh, business uh, use cases. Um, so in this architecture, uh, I think Kevin covers uh, persistent volume uh, core infrastructure. Uh, on top of the core infrastructure, we have our, you know, the microservices, right, for each, uh, um, infrastructure component that we deployed in a secure uh, OpenShift environment and uh, uh, and expose as uh, uh, the, the, uh, the API, right, for um, an user to access. And on top of uh, the infrastructure, we have our uh, machine learning pipeline component. Uh, you can see we have some pre-built, um, you know, the 
uh, model, like you know, the uh, Ignite OCR test run model, NLP Spacey, uh, machine learning uh, model manager, model deployer, and uh, intelligent domain engine. So those will be its own uh, microservices, has its own uh, Docker image, and it will deploy that its own part. Uh, later in the one of the demo I'm going to show you later, uh, uh, you can see how we uh, create and customize each machine learning component and uh, execute it using Ignite platform on OpenShift. Okay. So moving on to next page. Um, so here is another um, view like, uh, to show you the high-level architecture about the Ignite platform and how we uh, deploy it on OpenShift. Um, uh, for, uh, after that, I will show you the, uh, the actual deployment uh, using our uh, secure OpenShift. Right? Um, so as uh, as we mentioned, um, so the whole deployment is uh, the container based, and it can like you know, the, uh, plug in right in different shift right to uh, on a cloud uh, infrastructure OpenShift or on prime uh, VM or um, you know the on, on prime like you know the private cloud um, and. Um, uh, we deployed the whole plan from using the CSAD pipeline. Um, so uh, the CSAD panel can help us set up the uh, secret config map um, and all the uh, you know the infrastructure uh, component uh, component deployment, including the Kafka, uh, you can know, API, you know the Elastic Search, EFK, etc. Uh, and once we have um, the infrastructure component deployed there. Um, we can uh, we can then like you know to use uh, the Jupyter notebook as our uh, data science platform uh, to customize and uh, you know to build um, any like you know arbitrary machine learning uh, pipeline or workflow uh, using the predefined uh, component or uh, Docker image. Uh, here we show one of the uh, workflow we built uh, using this uh, Ignite platform. It start from the uh, raw PDF scan uh, PDF. And uh, uh, we can, you know, to run the test write, generate the OCR uh, raw text data, and uh, we can do some sectioning right, to uh, segregate different uh, uh, text right into each uh, section, and uh, run some NLP processing uh, through the Python Spacey library, and uh, we have our Ignite uh, customized uh, component called the Intelligent Domain Engine. To extract like certain uh, interest field, uh, interest field, right, such as uh, um, you know contract number, contract borrower name, etc. Uh, at the end, we have a handwritten uh, detection component. Um, the whole uh, model uh, is also a machine learning model is also uh, deployed and uh, version controlled using MLflow. Uh, for those if you are not familiar with MLflow, uh, it is uh, uh, an open source Apache project. Uh, which uh, offers um, uh, version control and the centralized uh, storage for any uh, machine learning model and support like you know Python secular model as well as uh, uh, other like you know Spark ML model in packet format, you know the TensorFlow right, right torch model etc. Um, so we are leveraging the MLflow as our model storage and we have our uh, building component called the model deployer uh, to uh, for the uh, deployment. Okay, um, so. Without um, any questions so far? Okay. All right. Uh, I think I think we can move on to the demo. So to uh, for the rest of time, I have uh, three demos for you. The first one is um, I'm going to show you how we deploy the Ignite platform to a secured uh, OpenShift platform, uh, and then followed on that, I will show you how to leverage the Ignite uh, platform on OpenShift to do the annotation and uh, using the ML flow to manage the complete life cycle of uh, machine learning model. Um, in start from the data preparation, how we can use our annotation UI to prepare the training data, testing data, to generate the label for our uh, supervised learning model, uh, and uh, all the way to um, you know, the, uh, you know, the model prediction classification, and we have uh, interface uh, application tools for you uh, for any user to correct the model output. Uh, and the last uh, demo, uh, I will show you how to use uh, a Jupyter Notebook to customize and create uh, an arbitrary uh, machine learning workflow pipeline using the uh, predefined uh, Ignite component. In the, uh, for example, the uh, Spacey, um, in the uh, Tesseract, OCR, and ID. Okay, 
without further ado, let, let me jump to the uh, first demo. Um, so the, as you can see, we are deploying the whole internet platform uh, into this uh, secured OpenShift platform. And um, uh, let me quickly uh, jump to the, the components we deployed. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we are using the, the CSAD pipeline uh, to help us like, deploy all the infrastructure component for the internet platform. Uh, and also set up the services uh, routes right for any like API or web application we expose to the end user. Um, also, uh, the CSC pipeline will help us, uh, you know, uh, customize and uh, configure the service account, right? Configure the map, and make sure the security is uh, placed uh, properly. Um, as you can see, we have uh, several uh, pods, uh, uh, the whole internet platform deployed there. So you see like in the multiple pods running uh, at this point. Uh, and uh, for the data scientist or data engineer, uh, we have the Drupal notebook uh, for them right to, um, you know, the test or develop right a new machine learning pipeline. Uh, you can see uh, uh, each data scientist or engineer and user, when they log into our Drupal Hub notebook, they will create their own pod. So they have a segregated uh, environment for them right to, uh, as and develop, so they don't need to worry about like, like you know, access control or other uh, users, right? Accidentally uh, change or remove their code. Okay. Um, the whole in that platform. Hey, hey, Hansei, can hey, you go into IQ first? Sure. So it's IQ. Yes. Right. Um, so let's quickly jump to the Ignite IQ uh, demo, and then we can come back to the uh, the detail Ignite platform deployment on OpenShift. So here is uh, the, the tools uh, for data scientists and the data engineer manage the uh, machine learning model. Uh, the backend is we are using the ML flow uh, to uh, store and uh, version control. Uh, you know the pre-trained model. Uh, it actually includes the uh, the whole uh, serialized uh, binary uh, of your model. Um, so these tools basically help you uh, select you know, the model uh, store. So uh, you can use these tools right to uh, check and uh, review all the existing model if, uh, in MLflow, and also you can uh, manage and create a new model through this uh, uh, web application. Uh, here, uh, I'm going to show you, uh, I already logged in as an admin, so I can, um, Look at you know the, in this Ignite model uh, workspace, we already have uh, three uh, models created, and um, uh, also I, okay, let me jump in one uh, model here. So this model is called Start Date. So what happened is uh, we were processing a bunch of uh, financial uh, services uh, contract documents, and the uh, the model will uh, extract automatically extract uh, the the content from the raw PDF. To get the, the start date, right, uh, for this, you know, contract. And, uh, uh, we don't have rely on any, like, a predefined template. This is a purely, uh, NLP and, uh, machine learning model. Okay. So the first thing, uh, you want to do is you want to create the model using this, uh, uh Ignite IQ admin, uh, tool, um, by, uh, giving the model name, uh, what's the status of this model? Uh, you, uh, the first step is always a setup, meaning, you give the model name, you set up the target accuracy, uh, you want to reach for the model, uh, and uh, you, uh, start like this, uh, prepare the, uh, training and the testing data set. So at that point, we are moving to the annotation stage. Uh, once the training data, uh, testing data set is ready, uh, we'll move on to the modeling stage, which, you know, so we'll train the model and validate the model using the testing, uh, data set. Uh, at the, uh, at the end, we have uh, like a holdout data set for you. To really, you know, to validate and test your model uh, without like an actual true uh, ground truth label. Uh, and uh, at this stage, uh, we have, uh, uh, you know, the user interface for the end user. They can go to the model result and manually correct or, uh, you know, accept the model uh, result. It's the last stage is complete. Okay. So when we save the model uh, in using this uh, admin tools, uh, what happened is uh, in the back end, uh, the ML flow. Well, it will create an entering a project um, in the ML flow uh, for this model. Uh, let me quickly show you um, here. 
Uh, this is a backend ML flow uh, engine. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, this is used as uh, our centralized model storage model database. Uh, it provides a version control uh, and also um, a some type of a model serving. But for the actual, you know, um, uh, Ignite workflow, we have our own uh, model serving uh, component called a model deployer. And I think maybe one thing here is I think a lot of the data sets that are being part of this ML flow are ultimately feeding back into the governance processes that organizations may have. So a lot of these statistics and um, data sets that are coming out, your confusion matrix, et cetera, can then feed back into the overall governance process of your model management. Yep. Absolutely, Kevin. Um, so as you can see, we have uh, several uh, runs already uh, for the same start date model. Uh, this is uh, the training uh, set model. Uh, you can see uh, what's accuracy um, and uh, the number of uh, sample. Okay. So here, um, the, the, uh, we use this ML uh, flow model to track the model performance and as well as uh, save and manage the actual model binary uh, in the serialized format. For example, for a secondary model, it will uh, save as a PICO format. And for a Spark ML model, it will save as a Spark format. Right, uh, so let me jump back to the um, Ignite IQ. Okay, so at this point, we already created a model uh, using this Ignite IQ element tool. Uh, let's move on to the, the next step, which is uh, we want to start uh, annotate, uh, prepare our uh, data set for the model training. So as I mentioned earlier, the whole Ignite IQ tool is uh, uh, designed to manage the complete life cycle for machine learning, starting from the data preparation. So let's say if you have- maybe a... one, one, one comment yeah. here, Hung Fei, is I think we see a lot of struggles around getting the training data and how do you get that training data as a back to your data scientist. And this tool allows you, sitting on top of OpenShift, allows you to, um, to, to, better, to get better um, training data, annotating that data, so that ultimately your data scientists and engineers can, can look at it. So, so go ahead, Hung Fei. Yep. Okay, um, as you can see, we have uh, uh, three Ignite models already loaded in this uh, uh, Ignite IQ. Uh, again, its backend is read from MLflow, and the model I'm into demo is this uh, start date model. Uh, the first thing is we want to have a set of uh, label data for our model training. Um, as Kevin mentioned, uh, um, this is uh, often uh, in the Hard right to for the data scientists to get the training data if this is a, a supervised learning model. And um, uh, for our start, mo uh, start data model, uh, we need a, a bunch of uh, uh, contract data, uh, the raw PDF. And uh, uh, for the uh, SME uh, from business side or data scientists, they can use uh, this Ignite IQ tool to uh, manually label our uh, target result from each raw document, uh, as you can see here. Where they have the, the label for the start date, and the, the extra text is shown here. Um, the reason we can show the extra text is uh, the, uh, all the documents, raw uh, scan PDF is already uh, OCR, so we do have the uh, OCR text result um, in the backend. So let's say if I draw another uh, bounding box uh, in the different area, uh, you will see like uh, it will return like, in the, the actual you know, text uh, data uh, from uh, OCR. In this way, uh, the SME or data scientists can quickly uh, label uh, the documents right by just drawing, uh, draw a bounding box around the uh, information they need and uh, um, move on to the next document. The and, and okay, maybe just to add a little, a little business context here is what we traditionally see is business users might want to get certain information out of unstructured data sets. So for instance, if it's a contract, they might want to pull out the contracting terms or they may want to pull out the effective date or the, um, you know, the completion date of the contract and be able to make business decisions on that. Are they getting the right services for the contract? Is it something that maybe is dealing with LIBOR where you have to figure out what the new rate is to be, be changed? So traditionally business people, business will ask a lot of questions to documents. Those questions have answers that are in the documents and the annotation process allows us to annotate those answers, specify them where they are inside the particular, um, the loom or the, you know, the output from the OCR process, and then allow the data scientists to figure out if they want to use some type of machine learning model to be able to extrapolate out the information or some other technique to consistently find that right information so decisions could be made, um, you know, from, from the business side. So that's, that's one of the areas of it. You can also do straight classifiers. If you have a bunch of documents, you want to classify them to different 
categories, you can you can label them that way as well, and then the data scientist can see the information to start building their uh, their models. Yes, Kevin. Okay, uh, once you uh, finish uh, uh, manual label uh, for the training data set, uh, we can uh, execute the model and uh, uh, generate the accuracy for the training data. Uh, uh, because uh, uh, normally the training, uh, the data center may uh, run like multiple ex experiments, multiple runs. You can also track the accuracy uh, uh, distribution and the accuracy trend right from this uh, uh, history chart. Again, the all the uh, metadata um, performance metric will be stored uh, uh, in the ML flow and uh, uh, in the real-time track here. Um, moving on to the test, uh, similar to the training data set, um, we also want to prepare the uh, label data for the test set. Uh, again, uh, data scientists or SME can log into uh, each document and uh, manually draw the bounding box for the actual label. And uh, once it's complete, they can generate the test data set um, accuracy uh, for the uh, for the training model. Uh, once uh, uh, the model is uh, you know, fully tested, uh, we can move on to the, the last step, which is a uh, holdout uh, data set. So you can uh, use this data set for uh, validation of your model. And uh, each data set um, is a new document and uh, the model never seen before. So if I uh, create a, like a new, um, I create a new um, holdout set. And this is where we envision having a, a business um, shmi coming in to, to start doing the validation of, of, of your data sets, of your whole data. So how accurate was the actual model itself? Yep. So once uh, uh, SME prepares a holdout data set, they can uh, use the test per training model for processing uh, each document. And uh, as model will generate the default uh, predicted result with the accuracy. Uh, and this point, uh, we do see like you know, some uh, result uh, output by the model um, looks correct to us, but the sound uh, result is off. So we'll um, start some, uh, the menu uh, intervention step uh, to go through each model result and then either accept the result or uh, correct it. For example, uh, for this document, uh, the result looks good to me, so I can accept the result. And uh, this result is also uh, looks good to me. Okay, and uh, moving on to the next one. Seems like uh, this uh, detection is off. We can uh, reject it and uh, uh, manually correct uh, the, the right uh, start date. For example, let me uh, pick up this one as our effective start date. Okay, and let's save this result here. So what happened is uh, uh, we just uh, correct this document uh, uh, result generated by our um, you know, pre-trained model to this correct information. And for the next uh, uh, training or next in the model updates, and it will automatically use the, um, this, uh, this uh, the correct information label to uh, retrain our model, right, to correct the result. And, and Hengfei, maybe, maybe something to mention there. When we initially talked through this, we said that all of our uh, data is stored in a loom. And um, this is the same concept for when you're using these, these inputs for the business, the annotation UI. So when the data scientist gets the output of the corrections that the business is making or the inaccuracies that they had in their prediction, they get to see that information into the loom to then retrain their models or update um, their rules or whatever they're doing to, to try to extrapolate out that information. So again, one of the things we had data literacy is how do you kind of have the, the understanding of data through the life cycle of this process. And one of the, the concepts here, we have our core concept is our loom, the store, track, manage, and kind of the data through the life cycle of the program or the project, I should say. Yep. Okay. Uh, at this stage, uh, we are pretty much done uh, for the whole uh, machine learning life cycle. And we can go back to um, our you know, admin tools to uh, upgrade our model status to complete or you know, the skill, if the model still need uh, more um, holdout uh, testing, you can uh, give it as a validation step. Okay. Uh, and uh, all the, uh, the whole tools is deployed uh, on top of a Unite uh, platform. And uh, yeah. Hafei, can you bring up the PowerPoint one quick time before you go back into OpenShift? I just want to show where you were in that life cycle right there. Yep. 
Um, uh, this so work if you think about if you think about what we are doing, there was the activity of the OCRing, which was done already. That OCRing then feeds into those um, business input functions. So where you can start doing the annotations and where you can start kind of marking up your documents, that then goes back into the data scientist. And then once they do and they build and they train the model, there might be a smart sectioning model. For instance, they might want to break the document down into sections so they can more granularly, you know, make predictions on the data sets that are being highlighted. Um, they could add some spacey there to enhance the data to better find the information. But these steps along the path of after you OCR it, after the business comes in and gets the, um, the, the annotations and the markups, you know, the next part then is to start breaking that problem down to be able to get the information out that ultimately you want to use to make your business decision. So again, we've kind of run one part of it and I hear to OCR it so you can see the document on the screen like you did. The business will do the annotation. You start creating different models, whether it's a model for smart section or you want to reuse this. You enhance your intelligent domain name engine. You add space to get better enrichment across of it. And then finally, what Hanfei will now show is these components will execute in a workflow that can scale up or down. So if you have to OCR, we know OCR is a heavier process. Maybe you have to OCR a thousand documents. You can have a thousand components that are running. Each time that component's complete, it's going back into Kafka to let Kafka know, and then your next component in the workflow is picking this up. So we'll do a small demonstration of the annotation's been done, the models have been built, and now you sort of want to execute this pipeline through these different steps to produce an output. And that's what Hongfei is going to show you now. Yep. Okay, let me jump back to uh, where we are uh, for the internet platform. Okay, um, so just quickly uh, show you uh, different components we deployed. We have uh, data for site uh, deployed for most of our storage uh, application, including the, um, the object storage meal uh, in the uh, distribute mode, Zookeeper, HA, uh, Kafka, HA, data search, Postgres, and uh, JFR Art Factory. Uh, we also have um, a bunch of uh, deployment type um, components uh, shown in here. Uh, including the, um, we have the Spark uh, MLlib component uh, and uh, a load balancer, uh, Nginx, HBase API for read write from HBase, uh, annotation tools, uh, component builder, etc. Um, so after you know, the, using the CSAD right, to deploy the complete in that platform on the OpenShift, um, we can uh, let you know data scientist or data engineer to um, use. Uh, um, this platform to launch um, or create an arbitrary uh, Ignite workflow uh, for, for their machine learning pipeline. So the first thing... Um, and I guess I'd this, say just one quick thing. You're going to be yep. using a Jupyter Notebook to show the ability to create a workflow, which is each component that you want to execute and then executing it through. Or, as we've seen some other clients and we do it internally, you can call a RESTful service that sends in your workflow that also executes this end-to-end -end pipeline. Yes, yeah. Um, so this is a Python SPK. Um, uh, we created, uh, it's called Ignite Connect, uh, but as Kevin mentioned, uh, you can also directly submit your workflow in the uh, JSON uh, format uh, to launch your uh, you know, machine learning pipeline directly uh, uh, through the Ignite API. Yeah, but um, um, the, the demo I'm going to show you is using the uh, Ignite Python SPK to uh, create workflow and uh, execute data using uh, Ignite platform. All right, the first uh, thing is so we need to uh, import several uh, libraries, Python libraries for Ignite. And then uh, we will define our workflow. Um, here, uh, the first thing is so we uh, will you know, read some uh, PDF, uh, scan PDF image right from um, the local disk. And then uh, it will uh, come to the, you know, the workflow definition. Here we will have uh, uh, several components we want to execute in this workflow. Uh, the first thing is because uh, PDF is a scan PDF, we need to convert uh, from um, you know the PDF to the image. Uh, and we are using this uh, uh, PDF tool uh, and uh, we call it a page scanner components. Uh, you need to specify component name, package name, uh, Docker image uh, with the tag information here. Uh, and um, uh, based on the number of documents you process, you can uh, horizontal scale, you can set the number of pods you want to execute for this component in OpenShift, and also uh, how many documents you want to run in one batch. 
uh, as you can see, it is very uh, flexible and uh, highly customized uh, for your own um, uh, processing. Okay. Uh, the next component we're going to kick off is uh, test write OCR component. Uh, we also need to define, uh, define some uh, parameters that you want to pass through the uh, uh, test write command. And uh, similar to the, the first component, you need to define the package name, component name, uh, image, Docker image with the tag information, uh, instance, batch size, um, et cetera. Uh, we do have uh, uh, two more components, Spacey, uh, which is running the ILP processing and uh, uh, intelligent domain engine to extract uh, uh, interest to field right from the financial contract uh, documents. Okay. So once you define each component using the Python SDK, uh, the next step is you can um, create the workflow. So it's uh, uh, actually defined the uh, workflow uh, pipeline uh, by uh, defining a data directed SDK graph uh, DAG. Uh, similar to Spark Contest, uh, at this point, it's still like a lazy evaluation. Uh, you just create the edge uh, for uh, the components, right? Uh, what components you want to execute in your pipeline uh, and with, with which order. And then uh, it won't execute until you uh, create the workflow and uh, say uh, kick off the workflow. So I'm going to uh, run this. It's already. The infrastructure kind of foundational pieces of the platform exist, but none of these other containers are deployed onto the platform until the execution of the workflow. And then there's a determination of how many do I need? So how, how many OCR jobs do I need to run? How many containers do I run? And they will run in parallel, complete their job, and then they'll all shut down. So it's, it's only using the capacity when it needs it, and then it shuts down and produces the output. Yes, Kevin. Um, and once we start the workflow, uh, the job is actually you know, submit uh, to the backend uh, for the batch processing, so it's asynchronously. Uh, and uh, to check the uh, result, we can go back to our OpenShift and look at the pulse here. Um, and you will see, um, oh, okay, so you'll see uh, we just uh, uh, finished the page standard component, the first component. And it's uh, complete, it's terminating right now, and uh, uh, move on to the next uh, second component, which is uh, test write OCR, and it's uh, launching the uh, pod right now. Okay. Also, uh, if you don't want to uh, using the OpenShift portal to check the status, you can also um, using our SDK, uh, which is uh, the workflow status. You can uh, check the status from here. Okay, so basically uh, it return all the component status uh, in your workflow. We already completed the page scanner, the first component, and now it's running the OCR. Uh, the rest of the component is in pending state. Let me see, okay, so OCR is uh, up and running. And go to the log and check uh, the status of the OCR. So we have uh, two PDF documents uh, processing here. Here, let's uh, refresh this uh, to see when the OCR complete, and uh, uh, move on to the next component space. So on, of course. And once all the component, all the steps define your workflow complete, uh, you will get a final uh, result in the loom format, um, and you can check you know, the what's the extracted field uh, result looks like. Back here, and uh, let's quickly see uh, the OCR is still running. Okay. Right. Um, Kevin, I think at this point uh, that cover uh, all my demo. Um, we're just waiting for the workflow complete. Great. Um, so I, I, again, just to recap on, on what we saw, we went over a little bit on why we decided to invest in, in our overall Ignite platform, and I apologies, uh, I did get kicked off a little bit there. Um, we had a storm in the past through, um, but we saw why we built Ignite, the kind of capabilities of Ignite. It's an open ecosystem built on containers, microservices that can plug into other offerings, so other cloud offerings, other data science offerings on-prem. And, and helps to manage the full end-to-end -end life cycle deployment and productionization, as well as model management of, of a model. Concepts built on top of a loom, so loom in, loom out, it's easy for everything to communicate with that. 
Um, and then at the end of it, it produces some type of output that's usually then fed to a downstream application. So there could be like an exception process where any of the predictions that need to go be reviewed go into an exception queue, um, one that could feed through, feed through in the, in the business system to help make those business decisions. Um, but that was, I think, everything that we wanted to show. Um, and again, apologies for the a little off and on there with the connectivity.